Good evening and welcome to the November the 12th San Bruno City Council meeting. I got everybody's attention. So I'd like to call, go ahead and call this meeting to order. Uh, thank the Garden Club for the floral arrangement. And if we can please have a roll. Councilmember Davis? Here. Councilmember Medina? Here. Councilmember Salazar? Here. Vice Mayor O'Connell? Here. Mayor Medina? Here. Uh, may I please ask uh, Mr. Michael Palmer, Chair of the Park and Recreation Commission, to lead us in the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Liberty and for all. Public comment, we have a speaker card for items that are not on the agenda. City Clerk? Patricia Melendrez. Maybe she's out oh, right there in front of me. Sorry. If you just go to the microphone, please. Hello, I'm Patricia Melendrez. My first time here, apologize. <laughs> um, I'm here because uh, the building where I reside, uh, me and all the tenants in the building received a 60 day notice on November 1st. Um, we, I've been there for 10 years. Uh, some of my neighbors have been there for 22 years. So we received it November 1st and they want all of us out by December 31st. Um, so it just seems a little, you know, fishy that it's 24 hours before the AB 1482 law takes effect. Um, and my request, which I'm here for, is to request an emergency ordinance similar like Redwood City and many others. Um, it's just, um, you know, sad to come home and receive the 60 day notice for the holidays. So that's what I'm here for. Thank you uh, so much. Thank you for being here, welcome. I uh, appreciate your comments. Um, as I had indicated when it was brought to my attention that I have spoke to the city attorney, I have spoke to the city manager, I've spoke to colleagues in other communities that are addressing this issue or bringing them before council or for discussion and or action. And I've asked that, uh, I'm gonna ask that staff go ahead and look at that and potentially bring it back at our, uh, the uh, 26th of this month's meeting. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else for items that are uh, not on the agenda? Now we'll move under to announcements and presentations. Um, I'm A. Melissa, I'll hand it over to you. This is the swearing in of newly appointed Planning Commissioner Aros Ansberg Harmon. If you can raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, state your name. I, Aros Ansberg Harmon. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith. That I will bear true faith. And allegiance. And allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Upon which. Upon which. I am about to enter. I am about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome, congratulations, and I think your meeting is coming up so <laughs> next week. Uh, item B, recognize the San Bruno Police Explorer post for a first place finish in the countywide Police Explorer competition. And I want to acknowledge our law enforcement personnel from our explorers to our officers um, that are here this evening to support them. This is something I've brought up before and I'm gonna ask Mr. Scott Rogie to go ahead and update the council on what their achievement was and why we're acknowledging them to tonight. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Council, City Manager. Um, I am just here to explain that we, um, our Explorer Post, uh, Explorer Post 559, has won the um, first place overall Explorer Post 
at, uh, that was hosted at San Mateo uh, Police Department uh, earlier this year. And it was uh, involving these individuals right here. Um, I thank you guys for giving us this opportunity to recognize uh, these, these young men and women. Um, they have, I've been with the department since 1992 as a volunteer myself, and I have never seen explorers as excited, as motivated, as they, they just want to work. They want to be here. They want to, they keep asking. We, we, actually, we have to actually ask them, you know, we, we don't need any more. We don't, because we'll, we'll have an event, we'll make one phone call, and within minutes, they're there. Um, the other day, Tommy and I, um, another Explorer advisor, had a last minute event, and they, um, we asked them to go ahead and you know, come on out. Every single one of them came out. So it's just, we, we don't have enough cars to get them to the activities that we're going to. So that, that's actually a decent, um, decent activity, um, de decent problem that we have. Um, to, to become an Explorer, and what they went through is basically almost the same thing that a police officer has to do. They have to go through an oral board. They have to go through a background. That's where we get real chummy with them. They, we learn all about them. We learn what their bedroom looks like. We learn if they make their bed. We learn what their grades are. We learn um, if they're good at school. You know, and, and we talk with their friends. We talk their, with their you know, not so good friends. And we, we want to know everything about the, them before, before they, they come uh, through the walls of our department. Um, and with these individuals, like I said, they have just, they've just been a whirlwind. Um, without a successful, um, Explorer Post, though, we can't go without um, partnerships that we have. And one of the biggest partnerships we have in the city is uh, Cappuccino. Um, about four or five years ago, the principal then, Shamar Shanks, allowed us into the school to go ahead and advertise our Explorer program. And this is where we got um, some of our Explorers here tonight, this evening. Um, I explained the prog program to her. She was excited about it, and she brought us over to Miss Joyce Lynn and Miss uh, Josie McHale, and we, we did work work fairs, right? Work fairs and work career days. Um, and fast forward to today, we have Jesse Boys, who is our principal, and he has done the the same thing and allowed us to to come in as well um, in our careers in the career uh, center. So, again, I just want to thank each and one of these uh, individuals here and uh, our fellow officers that all take a part in it. I would like to thank um, also you, the council, who recognized them a couple years ago, um, the Rotary Foundation, who uh, since its uh, inception, the Explorers Post uh, has been um, with us, and as well as uh, Dennis Zamet and the Sam Zamet Family Foundation. Um, and then also uh, to Chief Ed Barberini for giving us the latitude the ability to work with these individuals, these these, uh, these explorers, and then also um, just naming a couple of the explorer advisors, Tommy Ledesma, um, Sherry Campbell, and then probably the, the most spirited explorer advisor that I've met in my career here at San Bruno PD, and he's not here because he had a previous engagement, but uh, his name is uh, Ivan Castillo, and he, is, uh, he was an explorer from a, a different agency. We got him now, so it doesn't matter. Uh, but he is, uh, he just, he's, he's helped in, besides the explorers doing as well as they did, um, he's the reason why we have this plaque. So I'd like to thank him publicly as well. And, uh, and Mr. Uh, for Scott Rogie, who is a, uh, worked for the city for, a number of years in Parks and Recreation, as I remember him at the swim pool uh, to today, the passion that you have and that all of you have for this program. And the reason we wanted this acknowledged as well is, again, they won the county. We're not the biggest city on the peninsula, but I will tell you this team won and represented San Bruno and bring, br brought home the plaque and the victory. So I want to acknowledge them and I know the council as well because of the fact these are the future leaders. These are the young people that are stepping forward, filling out the application, going through what they must do to volunteer to this community. Yes, it may help them in furthering career, but this is where they are leading by example. And so uh, on behalf of the city council and uh, uh, the citizens of this community, we would like to also present them a certificate from uh, the city and myself. Do you agree their name, sir? Jimmy and Kawan.
Tyler Lau. Ronya Millie. <coughs> and Zidane Millie. And then if, if uh, Zidane's asked to speak for a moment, if he may. Believe it or not. You're taller than me. Okay, come on. <laughs> Thank you, Officer Rogi, for your kind introduction. And thank you, San Bruno, San Bruno City Council members and Mayor Medina for taking your time to honor the San Bruno Police Explorers in the way that you have. Inviting us here to be recognized by you is such a proud moment for us, our families, our police department, and our city, San Bruno. My name is Adon Milley, and I'm the San Bruno Sergeant Police Explorer. I've been volunteering as an explorer for four years, and I'm also the commander of the Peninsula Explorer Basic Academy. I stand here tonight with four of San Bruno's finest explorers who are the recipients of the previously said 2019 Best Overall Explorer Post in the San Mateo Police Department's second annual Explorer Challenge. As explorers, we constantly illustrate dedication, commitment, and hard work. Some of these characteristics can be seen through participating in ride-alongs, community-based events, sit-alongs, helping in the office, and even participating in the Explorer Basic Academy. In fact, four of the explorers, including myself here tonight, are youth leaders at the Peninsula Basic Explorer Academy, which consists of eight Sundays and one Saturday, going from 6 a.m. to 6.30 p.m., and the one Saturday going from 6.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. To our fellow mentors, Officer Rogi, Officer Ledesma, Officer Cristillo, Officer Campbell, who's not here tonight, and Chief Barberini, as well as the other officers here tonight, I commend you for all the hard work you implement in regards to teaching us and being our role models. Through your contributions and leadership, you give us the crucial support and courage to push through and reach high expectations. In addition, for us explorers here, it is important to not only reach expectations that are placed upon us, but to also exceed our personal goals in life. When looking at the future of society and the youth that possess these characteristics like us explorers, I strongly believe that we are in good hands and we can look forward to a bright future. Thank you. I want to say uh, thank you for your comments, and also Mr. Kuzak, who is also an explorer, wasn't there at that competition. But as I learned, uh, when one is, uh, gets an award, they all come together to support each other as you see the department well represented here this evening. So once again, uh, on behalf of uh, the city council and uh, the community, thank you for what you do. Thank you for the time that you have volunteered and continue to, and congratulations on your first place. Thank you. Now we'll move on to items C and D and ask Joanne if you would be as kind to direct her. Just two short announcements tonight. The library is pleased to announce its second annual Food for Fines food drive during the months of November and December. <coughs> Bring non-perishable food items to the San Bruno Library and have your overdue fines waived. Food for Fines applies to overdue fines only, not charges for lost or dam damaged items. The library will also host the Dave Rocha Jazz Trio, which will delight us with a great selection of jazz music for your listening pleasure on Saturday, November 23rd, 2019 at 2 p.m. in the library's downstairs community room. This program is designed for adults, but everyone is welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead and clap. This is, <laughs> we're having a good night. Um, okay, let's move on to item E. October 26th. 2019 public safety power shutoff recap. Uh, what I've asked is for the city manager to go ahead and update uh, the community. Uh, I, as you all know, uh, what has been transpired in our state, um, as well as what happened in the San Mateo County and our community. So, uh, city manager. Sure. Uh, Javon Grogan, city manager, uh, to the mayor, council, uh, members both in the audience at, and at home. Uh, I want to give a brief update about the uh, PSP, uh, public safety shutoff that our community endured uh, beginning on the evening of Friday, October 26th uh, through Friday, October 28th. 
Uh, I first want to say that um, as we all uh, know and unfortunately are now living, we live in a, in a part of the country now where uh, the power may be turned off and we may have to be self-sufficient uh, for uh, 48 uh, to 36 hours uh, due to uh, extreme fire danger, uh, wind events, uh, and PG&E um, uh, needing to address uh, their maintenance issues and, and their, their long-term uh, systemic issues around uh, their electrical grid network. Uh, but we find ourselves here. In the, uh, when these events happened, uh, the PG&E uh, has also partnered with uh, Southern California Edison because uh, they're not just occurring in Northern California, they're occurring in Southern California as well. Uh, we receive a 48-hour notice and then a confirmation 24 hours out. And so uh, your city did receive notice and we started working with uh, the various parties uh, to push out alerts. And so all of you that are signed up for SMC, the San Mateo County Alert System, you received uh, a number of alerts, both pushed out uh, from the county and pushed out uh, from the city. Uh, we also sent out alerts uh, before, uh, during, and after the event uh, via our social media channels. Uh, announcements were posted on the SB Response application and on the city's website. Um, First, I, I want to just sort of acknowledge on while, of course, there were uh, a number of implications and, and things that uh, the community and public safety had to endure with, this community uh, throughout that event uh, really endured very nicely and, and came together. Uh, really want to recognize some of the businesses that stayed open, uh, even some of the businesses uh, that at great expense uh, incurred the cost of uh, generators to power their operations to uh, continue to provide services to this community um, and be open late. I also want to acknowledge our city departments. And so I'm, I'm actually going to start with uh, public works because we really don't think about um, them. We always like to think about police and fire. But I, I have a hours reporting of the 673 hours that uh, city staff spent both preparing and addressing this event. And the vast majority, 229 hours, were spent by the, our public works department. And that was making sure the community had uh, water and sewer services and the sewer pump stations and the water tanks were all powered by generators. And so we had people uh, throughout for, on a 24-hour watch ensuring that the generators were working and refilling them with both fuel and oil uh, to make sure that this community uh, had, had those services. Uh, also, our, our fire department and police department uh, who were instrumental in making sure that uh, the community uh, was safe. Um, and and I, I missed another public works division, our streets division, that put out all of the A-frame stop signs throughout uh, the entire portion of the community uh, and along Skyline Avenue, uh, alerting people that the lights were out. Um, and, and so in total, yes, uh, your city spent over 673 hours uh, preparing for and enduring this event. Uh, not all of those uh, are what we call in, uh, in governmental speak reimbursable because time like my time and the mayor's time and uh, our department head's time uh, may not be reimbursable. Uh, so only about half of that is reimbursable, uh, but it was about $20,000 worth of uh, staff time that was in, in, incurred uh, to make sure that services were provided. Um, and uh, I also want to uh, say thank you to our city net, uh, so this, the people at San Bruno Cable. Um, even parts of the community that were not affected by the power ad outage uh, were affected by uh, some of their cable and internet services being out. Uh, but one of our uh, main, uh, what we call the head in, uh, where our servers are to power the network was out of power. And so there was a generator keeping that up for that uh, entire time period. Um, and we may find ourselves here again. Uh, there are a lot of lessons learned. Uh, we have what we call a, a hot wash plan where we're going to debrief everything that, that has happened. Uh, today we filed a grant application with the uh, Cal OES, the California um, uh, Office of Emergency Services, uh, for a grant to uh, provide uh, hopefully generators um, and uh, other supplies in the event of a, uh, another PSPS, which is um, more than likely to occur. It actually, I want to say it will occur. Uh, and I, I want to make sure that the community knows that and the community does everything they can uh, to uh, prepare themselves. In addition, um, it's also worth noting that one of our lessons learned is that there are a lot of vulnerable um, people in our community um, and apartment buildings in our community that uh, do not have or, or did not have the resources and the things in place to, to protect their residents. 
uh, in particular, there was one um, uh, apartment building that is uh, primarily tenanted, or almost exclusively tenanted by seniors. Uh, it is not an assisted living facility, so they, did, they are not required to have a generator, but a lot of their population is high need, uh, uh, and they were not equipped uh, sufficiently, and so we know that, and we will be uh, contacting uh, the owner of that building, and 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 hopefully they, the owners of that building will step up uh, and um, take on the burden of um, making sure that their residents are are, are safe. And so uh, that is our update. Uh, we will continue to um, be prepared and, and, and alert the community. Uh, one of the things that we actually uh, included in the grant uh, that I should also mention is we have a need uh, in the city of San Bruno for what I like to call a discrete notification system. Uh, so we can notify specific blocks or a very tailored uh, portion of the community. And, and so we, we, we uh, either through the grant or through another means would like to uh, better have better tools at hand to push out notifications. SMC alert is great. If you are not signed up for it, please, uh, please sign up for it. And you can go to the, our city's website and there's a link. Uh, from there, but that is for emergencies, but not everything is an emergency that we need to contact you about. Uh, and so we would like to uh, have, the, have that tool available and we included that in the grant application uh, and we will also be looking for additional ways to fund that. Uh, and Mayor, I also want to give the other announcement about PG&E. Would you like me to give that later or? Perfect. I just wanted to also circle uh, back, thanks to the city manager for the update. That was important, but I also want to acknowledge the staff you know, I went by City Hall and they were there in the EOC uh, and worked on Saturday. They were there on Sunday when I went by. I went down to San Mateo County's hot EOC that was overseeing the county with pg and &E in, in the facility to understand and to see where we were at. What I was most proud of is when I was updated with Supervisor Canapa on every jurisdiction on what their status was, whether the EOC in that community was being uh, personed or whether it was active, inactive at that point. Uh, again, this is uh, Sunday early evening. I'm proud to say that when San Bruno's name uh, was issued through the, the role, uh, we were the only active one at that moment. So it's not to say the other communities didn't do what they did. I was proud to hear that uh, we still had our staff active in the EOC. Um, you know, from extra persons, as the city manager said, an extra engine that we put on as well as <clears throat> on the villa is who he's referencing as far as the, uh, the, by the crossing of one of the buildings that have folks that need assistance in some manner. I did go by there Sunday night, um, was given a very dark tour because I could not see my hand in front of my face in the hallway. And so I did go back on Monday, uh, they regained uh, power at that point, but it is a lesson learned as far as even us as a community now that I know and we know if there is a need, maybe we can come together and have gone down there to charge their phone to, you know, you should have seen someone trying to deliver an oxygen tank, uh, a delivery person. So I'm hoping that this isn't something that is going to happen more often, but unfortunately I think we have to um, prepare for that just in case. And what I will say was I was on for two or three days, the Cal OES conference call for the state of California. And to hear San Diego, which didn't have it so bad, but in Southern California, they were really going through uh, quite, quite a challenge. So um, it's inconvenient. And I know I still have had a resident today who called me as far as the cost of their insulin and, and the food that they threw away and what do I do? So um, um, what I do wanna say is um, thank you to the community for their patience. And I want to thank the staff for being diligent enough to activate the EOC and maintain it and be there uh, in case the community uh, needed it more than we, what we were trying to provide and what we could provide. So again, thank you to staff. Also, I'd like at this point to have go back to our city manager. Some of you may or may not know that there was a the federal court in San Francisco. There was a hearing today and uh, some of us attended. And so I'd like to have the city manager because it was on the news early this morning and maybe so I'd like to have the city manager update us. Sure. Please. Um, uh, so the mayor's right. Uh, there were a number of us in federal court uh, this morning. Uh, myself, uh, Mayor Rico Medina, um, Fire Chief Dave Cresta, City Attorney Mark Zaffirano, and our Fire Marshal uh, Gage Slice. And we were in federal court with a request uh, to pg &E that they fund a 
uh, community benefit project uh, in Crestmore Canyon. Uh, we uh, were here um, and the city council adopted uh, a capital improvement project called the Crestmore uh, Fire Mitigation Project um, that's, that un really underpinned our request. And our request was that pg &E take the balance of their community service hours, uh, court mandated uh, community service hours from the 2010 uh, explosion and fire that occurred in the uh, Crestmore neighborhood um, and dedicate those to a community benefit project. And essentially we're converting about 2,700 hours into dollars uh, for a $3 million contribution to the city of San Bruno. The, the good news is that the judge supported that request today. Um, with a, 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 a few conditions, um, one being that uh, the court will oversee the reimbursement of the funds and the, the judge, um, and I think in his words, I've been around for 25 years and I've, I've seen um, uh, money squandered and I want this to go to boots on the ground hard cost. Uh, and so the statement was uh, the city of San Bruno, uh, we, will, we will support your request and um, the lawyers are to draw up the paperwork to request the money through pg and bankruptcy proceedings, uh, but the court will administer the $3 million and the city can seek reimbursement of hard cost only. Uh, and we outlined a plan for a capital improvement project that will provide much needed safety and tree clearing. Um, and there are four distinct uh, but related phases in the project. Uh, the first phase is to improve the, ac the fire access road in the canyon. Uh, to the tune of about uh, $1.2 million to uh, make a weatherized proof road um, uh, and provide uh, clearance so we can have fire personnel in the event that there is a fire actually get in there uh, and attack the fire and actually clear some of the lateral roads that lead up to the back of homes. Priority number two, um, which is estimated to cost approximately one point, up to $1.5 million, is to uh, create a 100 area of defensible space behind the homes uh, in what we call the urban, the wildland urban interface. So that area uh, directly uh, bordering uh, the canyon, the mouth of the canyon and the homes, uh, Stratford School, um, and there are about 137 homes that, that border the canyon up there. And so it's creating uh, what will be a 30 foot area that will be cleared of most vegetation and trees. And then uh, from, um, the remaining 70 feet, so from 30 to 100 feet, uh, a uh, shaded um, fire break where the limbs are trimmed up high, so if there is a fire, it doesn't uh, migrate its, its way up to the top. Um, the next priority, uh, which is estimated to cost $500,000, is actually bringing uh, water to the middle of the canyon and p installing fire hydrants along the fire road. What we see in most um, uh, uh, wildfire disasters is the ability to have um, water at ready access to actually fight the fight. And so installing um, approximately five to six hydrants along the, um, the fire road spaced about 500 feet apart. Uh, and then the fourth um, uh, item is to clear out um, fallen and diseased trees throughout the uh, entire 77 acre canyon uh, that pulls an access issue for um, if there is an emergency, getting crews in there to sort of climb and fight the fight. And our fire chief and the fire marshal did a great presentation in front of the court, really articulating the need of um, uh, fire personnel uh, put their lives at risk. Um, but those decisions are made, they're smart decisions and they're made when you know you have the resources to fight the fight. And so what we want to do is uh, increase uh, increase the, the defensible space, improve the road, provide water to the canyon, uh, and provide access. Um, and the $3 million goes a long way, but it does not go all of the way. And so what uh, the judge was very clear on is saying, Bruno, you really need to step up to the plate um, and spend the $3 million on boots on the ground. The city council allocated uh, what is now a total of $200,000 to begin uh, some of the initial planning and environmental clearance process. There's a lot of work that goes into doing a project like this. Um, and we will use those funds that are, are immediately available because of the council action on November 22nd to plan out uh, the project. And then we will use those $3 million to do a, a large part of the work. But keeping this up on an annual basis because uh, we don't want to spend $3 million and have the weeds grow back up in year two and three. 
uh, is going to have to be something that we work on allocating here. And one of the good news uh, is, is that Measure G passed. And so um, the city um, will, will likely have resources that we can allocate uh, on an annual ongoing basis uh, to keep up that mitigation work. And so it, it's really good news. I want to thank the mayor. I want to thank um, the fire chief and, every, and Mark, uh, everybody but me that actually talked today and did a great job presenting. Um, because today was really, uh, there was a lot of legwork to get to today, but today was really uh, presenting uh, a really detailed plan to the judge and getting the judge to support it, and he did that today. And he said, I want this money to um, get out of the bankruptcy process, I want it uh, deposited with the court, um, and I want San Bruno to do the work and seek reimbursement uh, from the court, and uh, they intend to do that. And so uh, that, is, that is the announcement. It's sort of hot, hot off the press from noon hearing today. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that update. Yes, they did a good job. And, and, and you're included in that, it, though maybe you didn't speak today. Um, we spoke last, you spoke last time we were at the, the federal court. But, you know, I also want to thank the, the council because on October 22nd, we took action to make it very clear that, which was articulated by the city attorney as well as documentation to the judge, <clears throat> our uh, willingness as well as commitment to ensure that these monies would be utilized for that fire mitigation to assist uh, folks in that area, which has always been a concern since that explosion. <coughs> so I do want to thank uh, council for taking that action and being committed to that. And once again, thank you to staff. <coughs> Excuse me. Next is uh, item F, San Bruno Mayor issued letter to SF Sheriff Hennessy regarding San Francisco jail. What happened was I was uh, got a forwarded text um, on a San Francisco Chronicle article of uh, 300 inmates needing to be moved from Bryant by 2021 from the San Francisco mayor. And a consideration, not a definitive, was also utilizing the property that is owned by San Francisco jail, the current jail that's been there since 1934. So I have uh, wrote a letter um, to the Sheriff Hennessy just as far as being surprised reading this, not knowing it, as well as checking with the city manager who was unaware of it as well. And it's not that it was going to happen or is, but it is a point that um, I, and I believe this council, thinks we should have communication. Um, we've lived with them, and I think we should be good neighbors, but so should they. Uh, I can report to you that as of this afternoon, I did receive a letter from Sheriff Hennessy and um, has committed as far as uh, being able to uh, have open and good communication and also with her uh, successor. Uh, there is a sheriff-elect now and that that will be passed on. It was CC'd to the mayor of San Francisco so that this community, its residents and staff are informed on a real-time basis and not reading it through uh, a newspaper. On item G, receive annual presentation from the Parks and Recreation Commission. Mayor Medina and members of the City Council. My name is Mike Palmer and I currently serve as the chairperson for the Parks and Recreation Commission. I'm here tonight to present the Commission's annual report for the 2018-2019 fiscal year and to outline the work plan for 2019-2020. Um, the first slide that you're looking at shows the Commission members for 2018-2019. The Parks and Recreation Commission has basically remained the same as 2017-2018, except for the student representative. That position has been filled by a young lady named Nadia Koshafa. Nadia is currently a senior at Cappuccino. She plays tennis in the fall, badminton in the spring, and loves to watch basketball, especially Cap Mustang basketball. I got this right from her, can you tell? Um, she would like to attend UC Berkeley to study biochemistry and major in public health, but she also told me that she would not rule out uh, studying political science. 
Commissioner Melendrez is a poli sci major from UC Berkeley, by the way. Um, anyways, all current members of the commission are pictured on this page, and uh, with the council's approval, I'd like to introduce some of the, my fellow commissioners that are here. Commissioner Ale Alex uh, Melendrez, Commissioner Lucy Zamatea, and Commissioner Lori Greenberg. And <laughs> I have to thank them for coming to listen to me talk at another meeting when they really didn't even have to. Um, slide number three shows the purpose of the commission. Um, and our purpose, uh, the purpose of the Parks and Recreation Commission is to make recommendations to the city council regarding community recreation needs. These could include input on recreational activities, input on the various classes and programs offered by the recreation department, input on the use of recreational facilities and equipment, and input on the operation, supervision, and maintenance of playgrounds, athletic fields, the community swimming pool, indoor recreation facilities, auditoriums, and other facilities to designated for recreational use with the exception of the senior center. The senior center has its own board, has its own advisory board that takes care of those functions for them. <coughs> Excuse me. So on to slides four and five, um, I'm going to talk about these both at once, and Danielle will move forward as we do. Um, they detail the Park and Rec Commission's accomplishments and other contributions for 2018 and 2019. Um, I'll discuss these and show them later, and, but in, just to give everybody an overview, um, participated in a community meeting held at Florida Park. Uh, we continue to participate on the city's advisory committee for the new Recreation Aquatic Center. Uh, advised and participated in the sixth annual Community Day in the Park. Advised and reviewed improvements made to various parks. Made suggestions, excuse me, suggestions on the redeveloped Community Recognition Award marketing strategy. Supported and discussed the Circle 3.0 tree program discussed securing Measure K funds for much needed improvement to the bleachers at Tom Lara Field, supported the installation of two little libraries at Earl Glenview Park, offered and participated in the following free citywide special events, and these include concerts in the park at Rotary Pavilion, the Easter egg hunt, the, ho the annual holiday tree lighting, uh, and holiday happening at the shops at Tan Ferran. Uh, the Parks and Rec Com Recreation Commission also offered and participated in the following other special events, the mother-son kickball and the father-daughter dance, screen, clean sweep flea markets, Goblin Grotto, aquatic dive-in movie nights and the polar bear plunge, and, the, and teen dances. So the first slide we're going to look at is slide number six, and it's about the community meeting at Florida Park. On Saturday, March 30th, 2019, the city hosted a community meeting at the site of the Future Park to obtain input from residents and to update them regarding the status of the project. The community meeting included a presentation by the city manager offering some information regarding alternatives to the original design of the park. The event was well intended, attended by members of the city council, members of the Park and Recreation Commission, local residents, and by city staff. Slide number seven is uh, the advisory committee for the new Recreation and Aquatic Center. And this sl slide shows one of the conceptual designs that has been developed as a result of the input gathered for the city's new Recreation and Aquatic Center. The Parks and Recreation Commission continues to provide input for this exciting new project in a number of ways. Commissioners Chris Gonzalez and Mike Palmer will continue to serve on the city's advisory committee for this project as representatives of the Park and Recreation Commission. The advisory committee also consists of members of the city council, members of the community foundation, city staff, as well as representatives from group four architects. Advisory committee meetings took place on January 24, February 28, March 28, May 7, and June 24. In addition to the city's advisory committee, commissioners Jessica Martinucci and Lucy Zamatia volunteered to serve on a subcommittee with members of the Culture and Arts Commission to begin discussing options for art to be located in and around the new Recreation and Aquatic Center. 
The Parks and Recreation Commission also received a presentation from Group 4 Architects regarding the status of the schematic design phase of the new Recreation and Aquatic Center. This presentation was given at the regular commission, me commission meeting on Wednesday, April 17. At this meeting, the commission was uh, allowed to ask questions and provided input to Group 4. Slide number eight um, is dealing with the 6th Annual Community Day in the park. And here you see several pictures showing some of the activities that took place. Um, the slide on the top right shows one of the rides that was offered this year. The slide on the bottom right uh, depicts part of the food area. And the slide on the left shows one of the other activities offered on June 2nd. That looks like a really fun activity, by the way. I may have to get involved in that one next year. <laughs> um, in addition to these activities, there was also the Posey Parade. Um, and just a note, it was first held in 1941 and continues to be the oldest non-motorized children's parade in the United States. Um, there was also live music, food vendors, the annual baseball game between Parkside Junior High School and St. Robert School, and information tables representing various San Bruno commissions and departments. This year, the information tables included bicycle and pedestrian safety, the city clerk's office, police department crime prevention, emergency, pre emergency preparedness, and community services featuring the library. Slides 9 through 13 um, show improvements that have been made to several of the city parks. All the, all the improvements that you're going to see have been made by staff and are the result of recommendations from park users or from members of the Parks and Recreation Commission after a visit to the park. Um, the first slide, this one, number nine, um, shows how the northeast corner of Ponderosa Park appeared before and after the city's park department cleared away some overgrown bushes and trees, and it looks much nicer now. Um, slide 10 is a before and after of the replacement at 7th and Walnut, Wal 7th and Walnut Park of one of the city's new garbage and recycling receptacles. Um, you can see that they're a big improvement over what we used to have. And these are going in uh, as they're received at other parks around the city. Um, slides 11 and 12 are, are uh, both for Bayshore Park. The first one shows the before and after view of an area near the common fence on the west side of the park. The city planted several new trees in this area and it looks much better. And slide number 12 um, shows where the before picture shows what used to be the basketball area, and then the after picture shows a new basketball hoop installed with a new key painted on the pavement. And these are both really nice improvements to this park. Slide number 13 is before and after pictures of the sign uh, that was redone on the Oakmont Drive entrance to Monte Verde Park. And you can see that the old sign really needed some work and the after sign looks a whole heck of a lot better. Slide 14 is um, about a redeveloped community recognition award nomination marketing process. And this sh slide shows a newly revised community recognition award application, along with a bulletin board located in the front of the rec center with a new application on display. At our regular meeting in April, a subcommittee consisting of subcommittee lead Chris Gonzalez, Commissioner Jessica Martinucci, and Commissioner Mike Palmer was formed to discuss how to better market to the public information and the application for the Commission's annual Community Recognition Award. <clears throat> the subcommittee conducted two meetings and developed several new ideas and strategies for outreach to the community. These include, but are not limited to, a stronger and more complete use of social media. These ideas were presented to city staff and the rest of the commission at the October commission meeting. The commission accepted and approved the new community recognition award application and process. And I just want to acknowledge the, the work that commissioners Martinucci and Gonzalez uh, did for, to pull this little subcommittee together. Slide 15 is and I'm gonna read exactly how it reads, uh, is the Circle 3.0 tree grant, tree grant Program. In the fall of 2018, Commissioner Lori Greenberg introduced this program to the Park and Recreation Commission at one of its regular meetings. 
Circle 3.0 is short for the California Initiative to Reduce Carbon Emissions 3.0 High Speed Rail or the Circle 3.0 tree, tree Grant Program. This is a CAL FIRE funded project intended to mitigate the environmental impacts of the high speed rail corridor, fa corridor phase one project. <clears throat> the program is managed locally by West Coast Arborists and they partner with local public agencies and community groups to plant trees in residential and public places. And to this date, San Bruno residents have embraced the program and 157 free trees have been planted on homeowner properties throughout the city. <clears throat> this, when you write, when you ask for a grant like this, it comes along with a lot of work and w without the work of the city staff, this would not have been possible. So I wanna congratulate city staff for, um, for pursuing this, embracing it and getting the word out. Um, slide number 16 shows the two little libraries that the commission worked with uh, the local residents to install at the recently dedicated Earl Glenview Park. This shows the location of the libraries. Um, they are uh, conveniently located near a United States Postal Service, mail Postal Service mailbox. And at this place, there's a little library for children's books and a little library for adult books. And you can see they're both filled. So um, there's something for everybody. Um, slides 17 and 18 show some of the free community special events. Um, slide 17 shows a picture of one of the concerts at the Rotary Pavilion. And uh, those things are very well attended. And the slide on the right shows a picture of the Easter egg hunt. Slide 18 has a picture of the city's Christmas tree decorated for the holiday tree lighting. And the other picture shows the annual holiday, Halloween happening, which takes place at the shops at Tamferan. <clears throat> Slides 19 through 21 are other community special events. And I just wanted to mention these because these are also all pretty well attended. Um, so slide 19 has uh, two pictures and you see there, uh, the picture on the left shows the mother son kickball event. The one on the right is the father daughter dance. Slide 20 shows one of the clean sweep flea markets taking place in San Bruno Park and the Goblin Grotto, which takes place at the Recreation Center uh, during October each year. Slide number 21 shows uh, some really brave people uh, about to take uh, the polar bear plunge <laughs> and, and uh, as well as a picture of a teen dance in the, in the Recreation Center. So now we're on to uh, our last slide, and this are goals for 2019-2020. Um, and the work plan includes, but it's not limited to, continuing to work with Group 4 Architects and Griffin Structures on the development and the construction of the city's new recreation and aquatic center, um, the Florida, Florida Avenue Park Development Project, um, continue to conduct park visits and help to facilitate and make recommendations to staff for park improvements, um, using Measure K, grant funding to make improvements to the Tom Larafield grandstands in collaboration with the San Bruno Lions Club on renovations to the concession stand, and also advise on the city's ADA transition plan for its, for its year one projects for parks. So that will conclude the Park and Rec Commission's annual report to, to the city council for the 2018-2019 fiscal year. I wanna thank you for your time and I'd be happy to answer any questions that the council might have for me tonight. Thank you, Mike. Any questions or comments from council members? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, and on behalf of the city council, please convey to the other members that aren't able to be here this evening our appreciation and thanks for all the efforts and the work and the presentation tonight. Well, thank you very much. And remember, parks make life better. <laughs> Let's move on to item five, consent. All items on the consent calendar are considered routine or impl implement an earlier council action. Um, would they may be in oh, I apologize. They may be enacted by one motion and there will be no separate discussion unless requested. Sorry. Uh, with council approval, I'd like just to make a comment on item G, just a comment though. Is there anything to be pulled and or voted on separately? I'd just like to make a comment on 5E. 5E. Thank you. 
Anything else? Okay. All right, so why don't we go ahead and we'll take them alphabetical. So we'll start with E. Um, adopt resolution, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. Adopt resolution adopting the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, self-evaluation and transition plan. Floor. I just, you know, again, wanted to bring up another um, expense the city has to incur, but it's a state mandated and it's an important requirement and it's something that we need to make an assessment, um, determine what corrections are required and make sure that we can um, put a plan in to list those, re those, those needs and start implementing some of those changes. Um, and you're already seeing some of those things that are happening, but it's, it's because of the public facilities or city facilities that we need to make sure we implement these changes. Another cost and um, of over uh, $15 million. So it's, it's a big expense and it's again, you know, where, do, where does this funding come from? Um, something that we're going to have to figure out how we find those funds, so. Okay, anything else on E? Any other comments? Then let's move on to item G. Accept resignation from Citizens Crime Prevention Committee member effective November 1st, 2019 and direct the city clerk to post a notice of vacancy in accordance with state law. And I just wanted uh, council and others to know that I reached out and left a voicemail for Mary uh, to thank her for her time, effort, contribution from National Night Out and all the other things that she has done with her time um, for, on the Crime Prevention Committee. So those folks that may be interested certainly can reach out to the city clerk's office and apply. With that, is there action on con the, in the whole consent? Move to approve. Second. second. Motion made and seconded to approve the entire consent. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? I have five of voice. We'll move on to conduct of business, please. Item 6A, receive investment report and adopt a resolution approving the amended city investment policy. Uh, finance director, oh, and Esther too. Um, Give me one second. I, I know you've been looking forward to this, uh, finance director, so please. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna pull that black thing away so they can see the screen. Okay. Oh. Okay. All right, good evening, honorable mayor, members of the city council. Uh, my name is Keith DiMartini, and I am the city's uh, finance director. I'm here with uh, Esther Garibay Fernandez, our financial services manager. And tonight, um, we'll be providing an overview of the city's investment portfolio and request to make minor changes to the city's investment policy. So the objective of this evening's pres presentation is twofold. One, to receive the annual investment report, and then two, uh, adopt a resolution approving the amended city's investment policy. So the agenda for this evening uh, presentation is to provide a background, uh, legal authority, and goals of the city's investments, review some key economic indicators that impacts the markets and the city's investment strategies, provide an overview of the portfolio, investment earnings, describe recommendations to changes uh, to the existing policy and request the council to adopt those changes. Uh, in prior years, uh, the city's uh, treasurer would provide a verbal update to council um, regarding the city's investments. In December of 2017, uh, the duties of the city treasurer were transferred to the finance director. Uh, so this year, finance staff have developed a robust annual report and presentation uh, to provide additional perspective on economic indicators uh, impacting our portfolio, strategies for cash management uh, and monitoring, challenges that staff do have uh, in abiding by the currently restrictive policy in place, and how important the management of the portfolio is at earning interest that could fund important city priorities over time. Just a reminder that the City Council does receive a monthly investment portfolio summary on the consent calendar, um, which is this report in your, in your um, packet every month. And then also every month you do receive a report on your ca the cash balances by fund. So Council does receive this um, on a monthly basis and this is just a more comprehensive annual report out. Um, so moving on to the next page. So first, just a background. Uh, of the legal authority of the investment, uh, the investment um, policy and activities. Um, all investment activities are governed by the California law and the government code um, and the city's investment policy. 
for public agency funds, the primary objective as required by the code is always the safety of principle, always. The investment policy authorizes uh, fairly conservative investments, requires monthly investment report reports to city council, and it requires investment decisions to be consistent with the prudent investor standard guideline, which states that an investment manager shall act with care, skill, prudence, and diligence of a prudent person's safeguarding principle while maintaining liquidity needs. Staff strives to generate the maximum amount of investment income and at the same time retain enough available funds on hand to cover the city's daily cash flow demands, such as paying our vendors and processing payroll. Many municipalities do contract with an independent investment advisor or investment brokerage firms to buy and sell investments. When an investment matures, staff will look to the market to determine um, whether or not an investment fits with the overall strategy of the portfolio with the highest rate of return. It's, it is in the city's best interest to obtain quotes from multiple brokers to identify optimal investment opportunities for the city. On a day-to-day -day basis, staff works with multiple brokers, one of whom is a dedicated public agency investing specialist from, from Piper Jaffrey Companies, who provides the city with investment banking, cash flow, and asset management services. The city has contracted with Piper Jaffrey for over eight years, and they perform these investment services um, for many other cities in San Mateo County as well. Tonight, we have Victor Umeyukaje. Uh, he's here with us this evening, and he's our public agency investing specialist who has over 25 years of experience in this industry. Um, he works very closely with myself and Esther on a daily basis on helping us manage our investments and providing an overview tonight. And he will be here to provide an overview tonight on some key economic indicators that impacts our investments. So Victor, if I can ask you to come up, please, to the podium. Good evening. Uh, my name is Victor Ume Ukeje with Piper Jaffrey, San Francisco. Your Honor, Mayor, Medina, and Council members, thank you for inviting me. Um, I have worked with the city for over eight years, and I have been uh, managing investment for cities and counties for over 25, 27 years uh, here in the state of California, working with state governments, cities, counties, different districts. Uh, our job is to make sure that your money is safe, and in doing so, work with the Treasury and Finance Director to make sure we provide uh, the very important economic and investment guidelines that make that possible. Uh, <clears throat> because you cannot invest in a vacuum. Just a few slides I brought in today, just to show you where we are in the economy. Uh, a household income and net worth have been growing, but of course every time we have seen growth during the internet bubble or the housing bubble, and now we have a different kind of bubble coming up, uh, we are afraid that eventually we might have an economic slowdown that comes after that. Next slide. Um, consumer debt have been increasing. One of the problems we've had in this economy is despite the fact that everybody have jobs, uh, wages haven't been increasing. But people are living like they have a lot more money than they were used to in the past. The difference between what they are earning and what they're spending is consumer spending, and we now have over $13.86 trillion of consumer debt in the economy. I keep going. Credit card interest payments are skyrocketing across the board. If you look at where we were in March of 2003 to where we are now, you can see that we've gone from uh, almost uh, $80 billion to $900 billion in payments on credit card interest payments. Um, we're looking at construction spending, and this is all to get, uh, I will bring it all together to get a handle on where we are in the economy. Construction spending and recessions go hand in hand. Whenever we see construction spending fluctuate the way it has been doing with private construction spending, um, it, because they are the forerunner of where the expenditure is going. And we're now beginning to see that construction spending is declining substantially across the board. If you look at where we were in 1997 on 02, December 07, and now December of last year, look at how much we're declining. Recessions 
and low unemployment can coexist. We have seen that before. We, you know, now everybody, we are like less than 2% unemployment rate, and everybody goes, everything is hunky-dory, but it's not true. We have in the past have recessions and unemployment exist at the same time. And if you look at August 86, August 96, August 06, August 16, you can see the substantial number of times where we have had a recession, at the same time we've had full employment. And the, the bottom line is, interest rates, because of all these forces, will continue to go lower. Right now, the rate you get in one year and the rate you get in five years is almost the same. And in some countries around the world, it's negative. You basically pay money for them to hold your money. So based on that, our portfolio is doing exceptionally well. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Victor. And so Victor, just uh, working with Victor, we wanted to provide just a, a number of slides that sort of talk about what some of the trends are happening in the, the economy so that we can understand that information and use it to better manage the city's investment portfolio. Um, so with this context in mind and some of those considerations, um, municipalities across the state have, ha have had to change their investment por portfolio strategies. And staff are focused on these strategies listed here to help us reduce risk from the interest rate fluctuations that could occur and retain the lowest risk possible for our investments to maximize the interest earnings. Staff are focused on diversifying the city's investment portfolio to include some additional investment options and maximize those earnings. Uh, staff have also contracted with two additional bo brokerage firms recently so that we can obtain additional quotes to ensure competitive pricing. And given the uncertainty in the economy, staff are evaluating longer term investments in order to lock in higher yield rates of return over a longer period of time. And in the coming slides uh, where pro proposed changes to the investment policy are being made, um, staff would like to increase the maximum investment targets by type to more effectively manage the portfolio. And I'll get to that in just a few moments. But first, I want to provide uh, just a brief overview um, of the city's reserve policy as a reminder for what is the, the majority of the city's investment portfolio comes from the city's reserves. Um, these are reserves that are required in the city's reserve policy. It includes reserves in the general fund, the general fund reserve fund, the general fund capital reserve fund, the emergency disaster reserve fund, and a few others. Uh, we discussed this during the budget process um, a few months ago. This slide here is a summary from that budget process uh, where it does talk about the minimum reserve requirements in each of those funds. Again, this is a majority of what the city's investment portfolio contains. This slide here shows a summary of what makes up the current uh, $87.9 million investment portfolio by investment sector. So the United States in investment in, uh, in agency investments include obligations issued by various federal agencies. The local agency investment fund, it's more commonly referred to as LAIF, is a voluntary pooled money investment account program that began first in 1977 and it's an investment alternative for local governments, and it's administered by the California State Treasurer. The San Mateo County pool includes funds from, um, from a portfolio of credit instruments, and it's administered by the county. Um, let's see, and the city has also purchased United States Treasury bills, and those are instruments that are backed by the full faith and credit of the United States federal government, and they're pledged for payment of principal and interest. It's important to note here that all of the investment sectors have very, very favorable ratings, very favorable credit ratings, so they're very, very low risk. Staff does monitor cash balances each week to confirm that we have adequate available cash on hand uh, in order to pay payroll and to pay our vendors for all of the priority capital and operating projects that, we, that, the, city might, that the city has. Staff retains a minimum amount of available funds on hand of no more than about $4 million at any one point in time to cover those day-to-day um, -day costs. A simple analogy uh, might to sort of explain this better is that the $4 million that staff has on hand, um, think of that as your personal checking account, that where you pay sort of your daily or weekly or monthly types of recurring transactions. 
and the money that, this, that the city has in its investment portfolio, think of that more as like your savings account or a CD or, or certificate of a deposit that you might have as well, where it's a, more for a little bit more longer term um, purposes. This slide here shows a summary of the investment earnings um, that are expected in the fiscal year just ended, fiscal year 1819. The city of San Bruno has been able to mitigate investment earning fluctuations and other risks by diversifying our investment portfolio into these categories listed here. The average yield or rate of return on the investment portfolio as of last month was 2.11%. Interest rates have uh, been more favorable over the past six months, but as Victor alluded to earlier, they're starting to decline and fluctuate more greatly. Um, as investments that we have mature, staff will ensure that we purchase uh, investments at the highest interest rate possible. I also wanna talk about our, um, our maturity for some of our investments as well. Um, more than three quarters of our investments mature within three months, which is a very, very near term um, view, and then the rest mature anywhere between 12 months to three years out. Um, staff will be reviewing our investment options to ensure that we are maximizing the rate of return over um, investment vehicles that mature over a longer period of time to sort of control and mitigate that investment um, rate of return fluctuation that might occur. So, so far we've only been talking about um, our balances and our rates of return on the different types of investments but I do wanna make sure that, that folks understand where we actually record the interest earnings in each of the city's um, funds that earn that interest. And so staff, uh, interest earnings are allocated to these funds based on the cash and the fund balances that are in those funds. This slide here shows the general fund, water, wastewater, stormwater, and a few others where we show what the projected interest earnings are in those funds in fiscal year 1819 and what was budgeted as interest earnings in fiscal year 1920. Um, investment earnings are an important revenue source for operational and capital projects. An example of this is the action that council took just two weeks ago, um, where you appropriated $125,000 into the Crestmore Canyon wildfire mitigation project using only the interest earnings that were accumulated from the city's investment portfolio to fund that project. The water and the wastewater enterprise funds have higher interest earnings compared to some of the other funds. And as discussed in the city's adopted budget process, both enterprises have many identified significant operational and capital improvement projects that span multiple years. And so those funds will be used um, to pay for those very critical capital infrastructure projects over time. So with that, um, this slide shows a summary of the current challenges that exist by staff trying to administer the existing uh, investment policy and proposed changes that staff are requesting this evening. Uh, the policy currently states that a maximum amount be invested in specific investments and it does not allow for flexibility in deviating from those maximum percentages. During the year, just to give an example of how this is difficult to adhere to, Large property tax payments come in on, on two installments a year. And when those cash deposits are made into the city's um, bank account, it throws off the percentage in these categories. Um, and so just to reiterate the point, it's a financial disadvantage for staff to have to sell an investment early, um, potentially incurring penalties, simply to meet a maximum amount required in the policy. Staff is also proposing to adjust the maximum investment targets for the United States government agency obligations from 38% to 75%, LAIF from 24% uh, to 30%, the county pool from 38 to 50%, and to provide staff an acceptable level of flexibility not to exceed a target when evaluating the city's overall cash, cash position. Excuse me. It, it I was gonna say through the chair. <laughs> um, just, just because I think some people might see the increase of San Mateo County pool, that, that may be of a concern just because of what has happened in the past. Are you, when all of a sudden it, it, it took yes. a hit? Yes, I'm, I'm aware of that, yes. And the county, the county pool has, has been performing rather well over the past number of years since that happened. 
uh, and because j just simply increasing the percent, uh, the maximum percent allowable in each of these, these instruments does not mean that we have to meet that percentage. It can be much lower. Uh, and it'll be, um, staff will continually monitor how that, how that pool is performing compared to the other options that are before us to invest in. Um, and we will weigh, we will weigh, weigh the risk uh, with all of the options um, accordingly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The current policy does allow for the purchase of certificates of deposits or CDs. Staff is proposing to increase the one year limit to five years to broaden the list of CDs that, are, uh, that we may be able to leverage. And then in working with our investment brokers, discussing potential investment policy changes with in, uh, investment advisors, and reviewing the investment policies of other cities in San Mateo County, staff would also like to add additional investment options um, that are being used by many other cities in the county currently that still retain a very low risk uh, investment options. We're proposing to add eligible commercial paper options to the investment policy. Commercial paper is a money market security issued by large corporations to obtain funds to meet short-term debt obligations and are backed by issuing banks um, and the company's promise to pay over the maturity period. Staff is also proposing to add California municipal obligations as well, which will allow for registered municipal notes or bonds of the state or local municipalities to be purchased. Again, those are two options that many cities across the county and the state um, have in their investment portfolio as well. In summary, these changes provide staff with some needed flexibility to be able to respond to changes in the economy, consider additional low, very low risk investment options in order to maintain adequate cash flow and maximize investment earnings. All the proposed changes uh, to the city's investment policy are highlighted in attachment three in your packet this evening in the track changes text format. Um, if the modifications, um, if council ap approves the modifications to the policy, the city's holdings will be adjusted over time, bringing the portfolio into full compliance with the new policy. So next steps to, is to receive the investment report and to adopt a resolution approving the amended city's investment policy. And that concludes my presentation this evening. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Before we come to council, uh, city manager. Sure, uh, through the chair, two really brief remarks. One, uh, I just wanna make sure that uh, the council and the public uh, really understand that our current investment uh, policies are really based on the model of protect the principal. Uh, and that is true with the recommendations uh, that, we're, that we're making. Um, the other uh, point connected to that is when you hear that our average uh, rate of return is just over 2%, uh, many people will say, well, I earned 7% or my portfolio did X, Y, and Z. Uh, <laughs> you need to uh, find some better investments. Uh, that's actually not true. Um, we, our policies are protection of principle. Our money has to be uh, conservatively invested uh, and made as, uh, as much available as possible. Uh, hence, Keith said uh, the vast majority of our portfolio has three to four month horizons uh, because we need that money available. A, large of the money, a lot of the money is money that we pay out during the year on various capital improvement projects or various approved expenditures because um, as Keith mentioned, a lot of our uh, major revenue sources come in, in, in uh, buckets throughout the year and we need to hold that money, but then have that money available maybe for payroll in six months. And so having a flexible but conservatively based um, policy is uh, critical for San Bruno as is other municip municipalities. And I just wanna thank Keith and Piper Jaffrey uh, for their work on looking at our investment policy and coming together with the recommendations that are before you. Thank you. Was there anybody in the audience that wanted to speak on this topic? If not, why don't we bring it to council? Any questions or comments from council? Michael? To the chair, thank you. Uh, so, Keith, is there a way for us to measure the, the relative risk of, of each of the investment options and to come up with some, um, some index of portfolio risk uh, that we could compare as we move these things around. I, in general, I agree that giving you the flexibility to move the money and let it grow where, where it's growing best is, is definitely a step in the right direction. But it would also be good to n understand how the risk profile also changes as we do that. 
I appreciate that question. And I, there is a way to do that. And the, the policy, the, the existing policy and the proposed policy currently do outline um, minimum risk targets that are allowable for each purchase that the city, that the city could actually make. And more often than not, the city chooses to purchase investment options that are, that are well above the minimum risk requirement for each of them. And so uh, what we can do over time is measure um, the risk of each individual purchase that, that are made to see, to, basically to ensure that we're, that we're purchasing the, the lowest risk possible investments over time, sort of balancing that with the, the, the rate of return that um, the city would like to expect from that and uh, managing our cash flow needs. So we would be able to do that over time. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I can see some situations where our appetite for risk might be a little bigger if we, I mean, if we have a fairly good understanding of where markets are going and, and things. And um, another thought I had, and I've always been a big advocate for us building our reserves. And um, I, I'm wondering, do we ever evaluate if perhaps our reserves are growing to the point where the, the the amount that we're making on those investments uh, puts us at a disadvantage where we're we're paying for capital that we've borrowed uh, at a much higher rate than what we're earning on what we're holding for emergencies and ever consider rebalancing those things. So I, I know we have a policy that says we must hold this much money. Uh, we have another policy that says we can only incur this much risk. And at the same time, we may be paying more for our other, um, for money that we've borrowed. Mm -hmm. uh, so is there an opportunity ever to sort of reevaluate how we're doing that? And, you know, mm -hmm. I was thinking, you know, in, in like my own personal finances, I may have money in the bank, I'm earning half a percent in a savings account, um, but I could go out and buy a car and pay 10% on that money. So mm -hmm. in that case, it would definitely make more sense for me to loan myself the money and then pay myself back over time rather mm -hmm. than give it to somebody else. But is um, that something that we should be thinking about in, in terms of how we structure our, our policies? Yeah, you bring up a number of good points, um, Councilmember Salazar. And so a couple thoughts on that would be first and foremost, as the city manager and, and I have presented over the past year or so, we are embarking on a fiscal sustainability project. And so that there's, multi, there's multiple components to that project. Um, one component really needs to be reviewing and assessing various pol financial re related policies such as the reserve policy, um, thinking about the city's debt portfolio and sort of looking at the totality of the city's um, financial picture to, to see if we need to make some potential changes or adjustments to any of those policies. So, and so I think under the umbrella of that project, we can revisit some of the components of, of each of those policies. But, but to follow on that a little bit further, just to um, sort of hone in on point, the, the city's investment portfolio, a majority of those funds do come from the city's reserves. And so the city is making money on, it, on its investments because of the su substantial amount of capital we have in the reserves. Some of the city's reserves are a set dollar amount minimum threshold, like the emergency disaster fund, for example. Another reserve, the most substantial, is the general fund reserve. Mm -hmm. It's a 25% target of total annual general fund expenditures. So as the city's general fund fluctuates, goes up, the reserve requirement also goes up, goes up giving us, again, more capital, more capital to invest. And so um, the, the policies are, inter, are interrelated, so we need to be able to look at them in a more, more holistically over time. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? Council? Uh, Marty. Yes. Um, can we go back just one slide? <coughs> or, I'm sorry, a couple more right there. Um, can you provide uh, a scenario when you would have to get up to 75% there? Because the other ones seem reasonable from 24 to 30, 38 to 50, but the jump from 38 to 75, mm -hmm. like, can you help, uh, help me understand when or why that would be necessary to go that much bigger? Mm -hmm. Being that that would be the majority where the funds are, are already allocated. I would say over the past year, most of the purchases that the city has made have been in the federal agency investments. Though we have seen um, the most favorable rate of returns um, in the portfolio uh, in those types of investment instru instruments. 
And so if that continues, staff would like to have the flexibility to go up to 75, not saying that staff would necessarily have to, it would just give us the opportunity to do so. And again, evaluating those rates of return compared to the other options available, we would make those decisions. And so you'd be um, taking the funds out of the county pool and the agency internet investment yeah. fund and, and just parking them over there? That, that would be an option or as other, um, if we have funds that are invested in a, a certificate of deposit, for example, once that matures, we would look at the market, we'd go to the market, talk to our brokers, and if, an, if one, of the most one of the most favorable investment options at that time is a U.S. federal agency, mm -hmm. we would likely make that decision to then transfer the balance into, the, into that account. And choosing that 75% is basic, basically looking at our past history or of the opportunities that we possibly missed by, by not having that flexibility? There's, the, there's a, a couple reasons why we landed on 75%. One is that I think 38% is rather low, especially compared to what that threshold is in many other cities in the county. Um, talking with uh, Victor and a few of our other investment um, brokerage firms about what sort of that optimal um, percent maximum um, should be. And then also looking at the performance in our current portfolio of those investments, sort of weighing all of those um, factors led us to propose a 75% threshold. And the important thing for everyone to understand is these still are very secure investments. All of them are highly the rated, secure, highly rated, double A and higher, risk, for double A or triple A or higher. Yeah, they're okay. all very low risk investment options for the city. City manager. Yeah, I just want to piggyback off what Keith mentioned, uh, and on the mat, on on the screen there, if you do the math, our current policy has hard thresholds for each of those three categories. So U.S. agency, LAIF, and the county pool, currently that are, each of those three add up to 100%. And so they're hard percentages, and so we're constantly balancing money, selling, um, selling investments early just to meet a policy threshold. The recommendation, both the 75% in U.S. agency, the 30% in... Um, if I turn around in LAIF and then the 50% um, in the county pool mm -hmm. adds up to a total of 155%. And so that gives us the, the ability to have some float in between those where we're not actually incurring penalties and selling investments early just to meet a policy threshold that's very precise. To the chair, I was going to say that's probably the most important comment you can make tonight was just what you said. And I think that, that I appreciate staff bringing this forward to us because we don't want to restrict and hinder, you know, the best decisions we can make and the direction that we can go. And I think uh, you've done, I mean, I, I kind of look at here and like, oh, I haven't done this before. So, so thank you for bringing it forward. And I think that this is an, an exactly what we need to be doing. So. Irene? I concur and I also appreciate the glossary at the end. Thank you very much. <laughs> and then just uh, within your report, uh, Keith, just so it's known too for the public, in 217 there was an, uh, it went to the vote of the people as far as not having a city treasurer and therefore that was adopted and passed by the voters and so therefore as in other practices the city finance director now assumed those responsibilities. Okay. If there's no other questions, this is an action item. There's the resolution. To the chair, I'll Michael. make a motion to uh, adopt the resolution approving the amended investment policy. Second. City Clerk. Councilmember Davis. Aye. Councilmember Medina. Aye. Councilmember Salazar. Aye. Vice Mayor O'Connell. Aye. Mayor Medina. Aye. Motion carries. Next, Next item. Finance Director. All right, good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, tonight I'll be providing an overview of the City's financial projection as of the end of quarter one of fiscal year 1920. 
So the objective of this presentation is to receive the first quarter financial update report as of the end of September 30th, 2019, and then also to adopt a resolution amending the fiscal year 1920 operating and capital improvement budget by approving the carryover fiscal year 1819 purchase order encumbrances and budget amendments, which is an action item required this evening. The agenda for this evening's presentation is to provide an overview of the Q1 projection, which will include the general fund, the enterprise funds, and the internal service funds. Uh, a summary of the purchase order encumbrances carry forwards, um, a summary of the budget amendments and the request to council. The city's current fiscal year uh, begins on July 1st of 2019 and it ends on June 30th of 2020. Staff prepares financial update reports at the end of each fiscal quarter. This evening I'll be presenting data through the end of September 30th, 2019 and staff will plan to come back to council in January to provide an update as of the end of quarter two, and then again in April to provide an update at the end of quarter three. In quarter four, the update will be done in conjunction with, our, with the city's fiscal year end processing when we produce the city's comprehensive annual financial report or the CAFR, um, which takes much more time to complete and that presentation is scheduled for January as well. This, this slide here shows a very high level overview of the fiscal year 1920 revenue and expenditure budget in the general fund. The city council adopted a balanced budget with the use of $325,000 of fund balance um, in the current fiscal year, which is much less than the $1.7 million fund balance that was required to balance the budget back in fiscal year 1819. The fiscal year 1920 budget meets all requirements identified in the city's reserve policy with $1.5 million fund balance in the general fund, 25% uh, or $12.7 million of general fund expenditures set aside in the reserve fund, and $3 million of reserves to be used in the event of an emergency. The revenue pie chart on the left shows the proportional share of the major revenue sources in the general fund, with property taxes, sales taxes uh, being the most significant sources. The expenditure pie chart on the right shows the major city functions the general fund goes to fund. As you can see, a majority of the general fund sources go to pay for the public safety functions of the city, police and fire. Uh, and just a reminder that these pie charts are only for the general fund. The city does receive uh, revenue and funds critical operational and capital functions in the city's enterprise funds as well, which are not depicted here on these pie charts. I'd like to provide an overview of the revenues through the end of quarter one compared to the adopted budget and compared to quarter one at the end of last fiscal year. Um, as you can see, the revenues are about 15%, which is very similar to where the city was at the end of Q1 last fiscal year as well. Property tax, uh, the city receives a majority of property tax revenues in December and in April um, as the county uh, processes the property tax rolls. Uh, and you can see the, the property tax um, is up a little bit through from um, some one-time um, ex educational revenue augmentation fund um, related property tax payments that did come in already this fiscal year. Sales tax revenue is budgeted, budgeted to be slightly above last year and revenues are slightly behind where we were last year at this time, primarily due to some timing differences um, from the state in a delay of many of their tax filings from a major system implementation they had um, distributing ta tax revenue statewide. There's no reason to think that our sales tax revenue won't come in um, on budget by the end of the fiscal year. Hotel occupancy tax revenue is budgeted to be slightly higher than last year and is on track. Um, VLF or the vehicle license fee, those fee revenues, um, I'm sorry, those revenues do come in at the same time as property tax revenues, which is why we don't yet have the revenue in place. Business taxes um, are due primarily at the beginning of the fiscal year for the city's annual business tax renewal process. You'll see some minor increases in business tax revenue um, with some redirecting of staff really supporting that effort and supporting some of the audit work um, currently underway as well. Departmental revenues through the end of Q1 are slightly um, higher in police and the planning department primarily from some of their um, permitting activities. 
On the building division side, though, however, there are, they are experiencing some lower fee revenue um, in Q1 um, in the first quarter of this, of this year compared to last year. Staff is closely monitoring uh, the division's revenue for any seasonal fluctuations and permit revenue, which um, is very difficult to predict. So staff will be closely monitoring that um, throughout the fiscal year. Just to provide a really brief overview of the expenditure. Sure. Just, just, yes. just a quick question before we um, move any further. For the card room tax, is there an explanation? Yeah. Why it's almost half? It's almost half. I believe uh, the card room tax the, in Q1 of last fiscal year, the, through the end of Q1, it represented two payments. And so that, I believe that pay, those payments come in quarterly. And so there was a minor timing issue where last fiscal year we got the second quarter payment a little bit earlier. And so it was reflected in the Q1 report. So on slide eight here, providing an overview of the expenditures through the end of Q1 compared to last year at this time, Q1 expenditures are at 30% of the total budget, which is exactly the same uh, at, the, at this time last fiscal year. First quarter expenditures were $15.5 million of the total budget, and all departments are within an acceptable range as of the end of this quarter um, at this time. It's important to note um, here that uh, the first quarter expenditures are typically higher than a run rate, where you'd expect a run rate to be around 25%, um, due to the city choosing to take advantage of the CalPERS prepayment option for both the safety and the miscellaneous plans, the city's annual cost for the unfunded accrued liability um, for CalPERS employment retirement of approximately $6 million, and that was budgeted in the fiscal year 1920 budget. Um, the city chooses to take advantage of this prepayment option as opposed to making installment payments throughout the year as it minimizes the overall costs. We don't have to make installment payments, which actually costs a little bit more for the city over time. So we, we choose to prepay that at the beginning of the year. And Keith, before you move on, I want to point out to council that uh, the prior slide, we had about 15% of the revenue for the year. And on this slide, we've spent about 30% of the revenue in that is connecting back to our prior conversation about how the revenue comes in uh, and sometimes odd cycles just because of when people pay property tax and when things are remitted. And so we're in that point of the year where um, making sure that our investments are liquid uh, and making sure that we can use pooled cash to pay some of our expenses that we're incurring in this first quarter because we won't get the revenue for that uh, until later on in the year. And so I just want to sort of this is a nice point to point that out uh, connected to the prior conversation. Okay, so this slide shows a summary of the revenues and expenditures for the city's four enterprise funds. The water and the wastewater enterprises uh, shows their revenues for the first quarter coming in as expected. They include three months of service charges for utility customers um, from uh, the five-year rate plan, which was adopted by the City Council back in May of 2017. Again, all those rate increases were budgeted as part of the annual budget process. Uh, in the City Net Services or the Cable Department, uh, the revenues are coming in fairly consistently as last fiscal year at this time. Uh, the budget for the current fiscal year was reduced by a little over a million dollars um, based on recent year's activities and the Cable Enterprise um, doing a number of things um, to review their, to, to review many of their longstanding um, contractual obligations, for example, seeing where they can renegotiate, um, looking for opportunities to reduce expenses, and cable is projected to end the year uh, with a balanced budget um, at this point in time. And then finally, the stormwater enterprise, the fees uh, come in as a special assessment, also related to the property tax um, billing cycle. So fee revenue for stormwater don't come in until December. Um, and in April in conjunction with property tax payments as well. This slide here shows a summary of the revenues and expenditures of the city's four internal service funds. These funds operate more like a typical business and they exclusively support the city's internal operations. Charges for each of these internal service funds, like central garage, building and facilities, the city's self-insurance fund, and the technology department, those funds are um, receive their revenue, their charges for services on a monthly allocation um, based on the adopted budget, um, which are basically paid for by the different city departments that, in, that um, require their support um, over, over the year. 
you'll see that the self-insurance fund has some higher expenditures during Q1, and that's, that's um, planned, and that's due to upfront payments for premiums that cover the entire fiscal year. And again, all the activity that staff is currently seeing in these internal service funds uh, it appears normal and consistent um, with the adopted budget at this time. So I know I just covered a number of slides with a lot of numbers. <laughs> so I just wanted to sort of, sort of boil it down with some key takeaways that staff have at this time through Q1. The general fund revenues largely are coming in as expected. Um, staff, as I mentioned earlier, will be closely monitoring the building division particularly um, to review any seasonal fluctuations and permit activity um, to make sure that the budget is intact. Uh, and with only three months of actual revenues to date, it is difficult to, ter to determine if there may be some revenue issues in building at this time. So it will just require some close monitoring um, through the fiscal year. Expenditure run rates are within normal expected ranges, again, within the budget. Um, and the enterprise and internal service fund activities, again, are normal uh, and within acceptable ranges. So those are the, the key takeaways that staff have at this time. So moving on to uh, purchase order encumbrances. This table lists the, the total amount of outstanding encumbrances as of the end of last fiscal year, as of June 30th, 2019. And staff are asking that the council uh, adopt a resolution to reappropriate these encumbrances into the current fiscal year, fiscal year 1920, to ensure that previously authorized funds are available in the current fiscal year to cover expenditures for multi-year projects and continuing obligations. This is a routine annual request that staff uh, request of council at this point in time each fiscal year. Um, and it's related, related to purchase orders where we might have a multi-year arrangement or an agreement with a contractor or a vendor. And we appropriate that money up front and we know that work is gonna span multiple fiscal years and so we want to carry forward that purchase order and that encumbrance into the next fiscal year to be able to, to continue with that work. Finance has worked closely with staff to um, review these purchase orders and that all of these projects are in progress and still being worked on. This table here lists a number of budget amendments that staff are requesting of council at this time and I'll provide a very brief overview of each. So item A is in regards to the fiscal sustainability project which again was launched a little over a year ago now, as I mentioned earlier. And the goal of this project is to assess fiscal challenges, identify strategies, and implement a wide range of actions to resolve structural deficit um, issues. Several activities have been completed, including uh, a high level assessment of the general fund fiscal challenges, the development of a cable enterprise business plan, uh, a revenue enhancement measure, uh, a local sales tax measure, measure, measure G, the establishment of a comprehensive development impact fee program, uh, implementing budgetary and expenditure controls, and modernizing the city's utility billing practices. Uh, there are a number of efforts that are currently underway, such as auditing the city's major revenue sources for property, sales tax, um, transient occupancy tax, and business license tax, and also working on a short-term rental ordinance. The next phase of this project uh, is before you this evening, requesting $150,000 allocated for various operational assessments and strategy, um, and strategy, strategy analyses, which would include, which may include a citywide fleet study, a citywide facilities assessment, a downtown parking meter program analysis, and a stormwater funding assessment. Item B is, uh, in regards to the Affordable Housing Fund implementa Implementation Plan. Currently, the city has approximately $3.8 million in the city's affordable housing in lieu fund. This, this fund was established nearly 11 years ago and it applies for residential and non-residential development projects. And staff is requesting the city council to appropriate $70,000 from that fund to hire a consulting firm to conduct research and develop a plan and implementation alternatives including policy options and funding opportunities for, pr for the programming of the funds in the future. And the implementation plan would help to ensure the funds are programmed effectively. Item C on this list is the transit improvements for re in regards to the county measure W. In 2018, the voters in San Mateo County passed measure W, 
to provide the county with additional resources through a half cent sales tax increase to improve transit and relief traffic congestion. The sales tax increase took effect in July of 2019 and it includes funds for highway projects, local street repair, and many similar types of projects. The City of San Bruno's annual allocation is just over $452,000. Staff is requesting um, that a new fund be created for the tracking purposes of the revenues and expenditures from this uh, measure. And staff will come back to council at a later time requesting the expenditure appropriation of how those funds are to be used, either at a subsequent meeting or during the upcoming budget cycle. Item D is the well rehabilitation project for well 16. Staff is requesting an additional $275,000 be appropriated to the well for the removal and replacement of various valves, pneumatic uh, operators, flow meters, and other electrical work that are required to address immediate issues that the well is currently experiencing. Item E is in regards to a grant that the library recently received uh, awarded uh, for the Library Services and Technology Act grant for modern technology related to the purchase of computer equipment and supplies and technology instructors on the amount of $47,250. And the grant funds will be used to teach six hands-on digital literacy classes um, at the public library. Item F is in regards to satellite phones that were included in the fiscal year 1920 adopted budget as an enhancement request that council adopted. And staff is requesting the approval of an additional $3,000 of the asset forfeiture fund to complete the purchase of those phones. And then finally, item G, the police department is requesting to purchase a license plate reader system to support parking enforcement uh, efforts by digitally chalking vehicles, reducing the need for a community service officer to get out of their vehicle and physically chalk a violating vehicle. The vehicles would be chalked virtually and it would reduce any physical strain on the officer, increase officer safety, it potentially reduce cheating by violators and improve enforcement efficiency. Um, after the first year, there will be an annual maintenance charge that would be incorporated in the police department's operating budget um, beginning in fiscal year 2021 and going forward. What's not on this chart but in the staff report is a list of a few vehicle changes that the police department is also requesting. Um, again, those are described in the staff report. So my, my request to council this evening is to receive the first quarter financial update report as of the end of September 30th, and then adopt a resolution amending the fiscal year 1920 operating and capital improvement budget by approving the carryover from prior fiscal year purchase order encumbrances and also approve of the requested budget amendments before you this evening. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Questions, comments from council? Michael? Um, Give me a second. One sec. Right. Marty? Your light's on. Did you have it? Oh, sorry. Oh, it's all right. Michael? In in general, everything sounds good and definitely appreciate all the uh, effort that went into this. Um, the only thing for the, um, for the budget amendments, um, I wanted some more time to kind of go through what, what those are and how they impact the, the overall um, budget that we have approved so far. And um, I, I didn't really have enough time to really sift through that. so. Um, I'd be willing to uh, approve the remainder of this going forward, but ask for that maybe just that portion on the the changes uh, be brought back at the next meeting if if the if my uh, colleagues here concur on that. Just um, I was wanted a little bit more time to understand the the impact of all of those and and why they're being uh, requested. So that, that would be director. my only request. Uh, is that for every fund or yeah. for one fund in particular? Just across the board. Okay, please. Well, we exclude the grant. We we could exclude the grant. That's that's neutral. Water that's fund. The waterfront comes out of enterprise funds. For uh, other than general okay. fund I'll, projects, I'll, I can agree to that. Okay. So what I'm so, hearing from council and staff, is yeah. general fund specific. Is that so? Correct? The only thing that's general fund is the first one. Um, there is the. Asset forfeiture, uh, the grant, the revolve, 
the equipment revolving fund for the license plate reader um, measure W water fund and then the, the in lieu fund. So are there, are, are there anything council wants to approve tonight and then we bring back for further discussion or the entire lot? So obviously the measure W is income from right yeah, yeah that's that's just that's other. just revenue I'm, right. I'm more concerned about the the expenditures and um can you can you pull them through um the item numbers or item letters? to the chair yeah, please morning so other than a yeah. everything else approved the 150. Yeah, if, uh, if the rest of the council is in agreement, um, I could go along with that. I, I just, I, I didn't feel like I had enough time sure. to go through all of it. And But if the rest of the council is, is uh, okay with moving forward with them, um, I mean, I, I just, it was a request. I, I just wanted a little bit more time to digest the, all so the details. Th there was a lot of information in there, so. Okay, so are we down to the item A for the general fund for 150000 Is that, or did you want more than that? I mean, the amendments. It's it, it's it's up to the rest of the council and how comfortable they are with uh, with approving the rest of it. It's just um, I don't know. I, I'm um, kind kind of sensitive to the fact that we, we we put a lot of effort initially into getting ourselves into a good place, and I just want to make sure that we're not uh, overextending ourselves. So, just for my own personal comfort level, I, I wanted a little bit more time, but um, right, and I'm fine with that. Okay, personally, so that's what I'm just trying to quantify because obviously I would think C is not necessary, E is not necessary. Right. So, was there something other than A that you'd like more uh, opportunity? No, no. Actually, if we could, uh, well, maybe A and the A, a and G, the a equipment and G. revolving fund. Okay. Right. Okay. Staff? As the council wishes. Okay, so Councilman Selzer, you're asking for A and G mm -hmm. to, uh, and then approve B, C, D, E, and F as far as uh, budget amendments. Uh, as far as amendments, correct. Okay. So uh, that's been proposed by our colleague is uh, if the council is good, I, can the uh, resolution be introduced if that's what the council chooses with the, those two exceptions? Okay, what's the pleasure of the council? Unless there were other questions, of course, please. I'm sorry. No, I'm good. No? No. No. Right. Okay. Good. Well, thank you. you sure. I will make a motion. Uh, let's see, we have a few different things here, right? So we have to. Uh, Oh. Near. The resolution approving the carryovers of 1819 uh, purchase order encumbrances and the budget amendments minus uh, A and G. Would that be acceptable? No. Okay. Okay, you did it. <laughs> Michael, is that okay? So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Councilmember Davis? Aye. Councilmember Medina? Aye. Councilmember Salazar? Aye. Vice Mayor O'Connell? Aye. Mayor Medina? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. And, and uh, staff, would we thinking that would come back on the 26th or? Yes. yes. Okay, good. And I'll, I'll be ready to approve Okay. It. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your reports. Uh, next item, please. Item 6C, adopt resolution joining other Bay Area cities and raising awareness and sparking action and conversations to stop hate and to build inclusion by declaring November 17th through 23rd, 2019 as United Against Hate Week. City Manager. Sure, Javon Grogan, City Manager. Uh, I'll do a quick uh, brief introduction of this and then I'd like to turn it over to the mayor who I know has been working uh, with other cities uh, on this. And so um, what we're here to talk about it and the requested action is that the city council adopt a resolution joining other Bay Area cities in raising awareness and sparking action and conversations to stop hate and to build inclusion by declaring uh, November 17th through the 23rd United Against Hate Week. Uh, and so the really quick presentation, a, a quick background, uh, a little talk about raising awareness and building inclusion, uh, what United Against Hate Week is and open for any questions. And so United Against Hate Week uh, really started in, in, in 2017 and it started right here in the Bay Area 
uh, started by cities uh, mainly in the East Bay uh, that really wanted to respond to a sharp rise uh, in hate in, in, in all its various forms, um, really not, uh, not one political party against another, not one version of hate, just in general, uh, sort of wanted to uh, step forward. And even though it was led by a number of cities, it, it was really a grassroots uh, thing uh, that uh, started uh, organically in, in, in many communities once they found out about what United Against Hate was, wait, what United Against Hate was. And so it, it's kind of that thing that how can you be against hate? <laughs> you know, how can, how, how can you um, uh, say no to being against hate? Uh, and it, it really empowers residents to take actions and really just have conversations about uh, the various forms of hate that are present in today's society. Um, and so uh, take action against growing intelligence, uh, reject negative messages, stop hate and implicit bias, uh, and work re really work together as a community to respond. Uh, restore respect, in, in verse, uh, embrace diversity as a strength. And I, I sort of pause there because every time I, I drive or walk down uh, our downtown, uh, just the collection of diversity, uh, people walking on the street, the various residents, I think we just sort of intrinsically do that here um, and build in inclusion and an equitable community. Uh, and so uh, the slide that's up there really shows a number of cities uh, all across, uh, the, the, actually all of California uh, and even um, um, uh, uh, other parts of the country are really engaged. But there's a specific focus in the Bay Area. And over the last two years, you had a number, uh, over 17 cities in the East Bay participating and not very many cities on the peninsula. Uh, and so there was a dedicated outreach to get uh, various communities on the peninsula involved in the campaign against hate. And there was meetings at the city manager's um, uh, association. There was meeting uh, at the, the mayor's council uh, as well. Um, and so these are sort of, I'll hold these up. Uh, this is sort of the general one, Bay Area stands united against hate. Uh, and then every city, should they choose, could have a uh, dedicated poster um, developed and so should the council adopt this we are ready to have these printed and passed out free of charge uh, to members in the community for them to display uh, and, and part of the campaign is very passive it's saying you know what I, I stand against hate in all its very forms uh, others is active where you get involved with your community and you just have conversations um, really t to build community and increase dialogue uh, and I know that there are a number of efforts going around uh, various cities in the county, and, and that's why uh, the resolution is before you tonight. Here for any questions, and I'll toss it to Mayor Medina. No, I, I, thank you, and, and have to give credit to our city manager who uh, was uh, instrumental in bringing some of this forward to the North County uh, mayors. So it was brought up there, it was brought up at the, Cal uh, the Council of Cities dinner for the San Mateo County, it was brought up at the Board of Supervisors this morning uh, for them to pass a resolution. <clears throat> it, it also started where the city of Millbrae, city of Burlingame, and the city of San Bruno kind of got together and say, let's reach out to the rest of the communities in the county. Um, as, as we know, it's more on the East Bay, but it was important to bring it here. Uh, I know they've also, They've had speakers at the uh, San Mateo Union High School District and all the principals are there. I've spoken to the Cappuccino principal, Jesse, who was bringing stuff to the leadership class there. So again, when I brought it up before and the reason for a resolution, um, because I think it's, it's more symbolic than just a proclamation that I sign. I think it's critical that it's a, a united, unified effort. Uh, and like the city manager said, I don't think many of us can differ in this community that we need to be tolerant and we need uh, to embrace diversity. And I think back to when Michael Salazar and I attended St. Bruno's when they had a candlelight vigil. And that's what also stemmed it a little bit too, was just that folks wanted to feel that they could do something somehow to uh, bring attention to it. And it's uh, a week near our Thanksgiving. And so uh, that's why it's uh, before you this evening. And so if there's any questions or comments. Irene. Thank you. Um, I appreciate both of you bringing this forward. I think it's a wonderful idea. Is there a way we can put the poster, if we pass this resolution, put this poster prominently on our homepage, our website? Okay. And then just because we have a week dedicated to it doesn't mean if we put posters up that the posters have to come down. We can remind ourselves all the time that this is who we should be. Thank you. 
Sorry. I was Lord. just going to ask the mayor, what were, are there any other plans to reach out with um, this message and ensuring that it gets out to the community? Is there, is, you know, I think the webpage is a great idea, um, but what are some other things? That well, as, I, this as I was reminded today, like when we thought about pr printing these, it's uh, if the resolution wasn't adopted by the council, then um, we shouldn't. But I have reached out to, uh, like I said, the high school principal, and they have been reached out to, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, Burlingame and Millbrae. But if the council is uh, in support of this, then we will be doing a couple things. First is ordering signs and uh, distributing those, and also building the start of it. It's only been around for a couple years, so it's building the start in this county, uh, which again, like the Board of Supervisors just passed this morning, so I need to get circled back around on, on what their thoughts are too. I'm assuming it was passed, I wasn't there. Marty. So as long as, um, including the elementary schools and um, the private schools in our uh, community, I think that would be great that we made sure we had enough Maybe not for every single kid, or maybe maybe for every single kid. I, I mean, well, that's a good. Go ahead, Laura. I was just going to say you can send electronic copies to schools, yes. and they can generate their own. They do also electronic email notifications to this to parents and stuff like that. So, I, I just really, I guess, I would like to see. These are some great ideas, but really, you know, if you need help in that, I am willing to help out. But really, a good sort of plan um, should this get passed tonight? Mr. Mayor? Uh, yes. Um, Project Pride probably could uh, look at uh, a couple of events, maybe an event or two about how we could help spread the message and so it's not just a flyer that it's it's some uh, something else. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Like, I, like the city man. I'm sorry, just Michael. One comment. I, I, I happened Please. to look at the website and I noticed that Mills High School has an event planned for uh, for the 18th. Mm -hmm. So um, be great to support their event. And it's, it's kind of late for us to do our own. We were invited, but uh, uh, I needed to come to council first. Ah, okay. Good. There, we have been invited. There, there is a whole. Uh, I'm sorry, through the chair. There, there is uh, a social media plan. Uh, behind it and the United Against Hate Week organization uh, supports organizations uh, to help with social media posts uh, and they have suggested posts and things like that. So there, there's actually an infrastructure behind mm -hmm. this so we're not creating whole cloth. No, there's the, the lady that made a presentation uh, for the North County, that's what they do when they have the whole system and that's where the signs are, yeah. they did them um, for us just to have something to show this evening as well. Okay. Any action by council? Motion to approve. Second. Okay. Councilmember Davis? Aye. Councilmember Medina? Aye. Councilmember Salazar? Aye. Vice Mayor O'Connell? Aye. Mayor Medina? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, then we'll move on to comments from council members. I have one. Irene, please. Thank you. I would like to remind people that November 20th from 4 to 7 at the American Legion Hall on San Mateo Avenue is the Coats for Kids. Um, they will be distributing coats that um, either lightly used or new that have been donated by many members of the community. And if you either want to volunteer to help distribute them um, or if you know families that might need them, please direct them to that area. Um, also, uh, Archuk Joe's Dennis Samet has volunteered, well, I persuaded him to let us use his parking lot. So if you're volunteering, you don't want to get a ticket on San Mateo Avenue, which is only two hour parking, you can park um, inside his, his parking lot and just let him know that you're part of the organization. Arnie? Yes, I uh, wanted to talk about this movement. Um, it's called Movember. It's November with an M. And, th and the whole point behind it is uh, for men to be more aware of, of, of their health and, and, and um, in particular prostate cancer, testicular cancer, mental health and suicide prevention. And the idea behind that is to grow a mustache or other facial hair to, to draw attention so that when somebody kind of says, hey, you know, what's up with the beard? What's up with the mustache? And you say, well, I'm growing it for Movember. Uh, take a look at it on, online and uh, make sure the, 
the men in your life are uh, looking after themselves and uh, taking care of these issues. So um, I'd like to encourage everybody that can and appreciate the, those that already have it um, and those younger that would like to try it. I think it's, uh, it's a good way of uh, helping spread the news and it's a different look. So uh, enjoy out there. Um, I guess I'm just going to mention maybe because uh, I just thought it was a, a great, it was a cold night, but a good night. Uh, the Cappuccino um, won both their uh, JV game, um, I think 36 to 6 is what I'm thinking, and then the varsity, which uh, went again won against Cappuccino, which had an 8-1 record, maybe in a different league, but still, uh, and they won 33-0, to zero, so. Oh, well, it's, it's already happened. Um, so uh, congratulations to, to them both. They were very excited and uh, uh, appreciate that. So with that, we'll go ahead and adjourn to our next regular scheduled council meeting being held right here, November 26, 7 o'clock here at the Senior Center. Good night. <laughs>